What does the way Sir Keir Starmer has handled the Diane Abbott case this week tell us about what kind of Prime Minister he might be if Labour win? Yeah, I think that's exactly the right question to ask. I think asking a question about how this is going to affect the general election, I'm not sure it's going to affect the general election all that much. But it does raise questions about how Keir Starmer in number 10 will operate, how he will balance the various issues within the Labour Party and the various factions, the warring factions within the Labour Party. There's this eternal civil war, it seems, between uh, different groups within that party. When Corbyn was in charge, he tried to kick out certain people. Now the other lot are in charge, they're trying to kick out other people. They never really settle down. But perhaps what was most interesting is where uh, Keir Starmer over the last three or four days, or at least people around him, tried to take someone out and failed. And that shows that perhaps he's not all powerful when it comes to making decisions. Perhaps that, he overstretched sorry. and was then kicked around by the union bosses and by Angela Rayner. So I think there's a big difference between Diane Abbott and then some of the other left-wing mm -hmm. candidates that have been excluded. And I think Diane Abbott was handled quite badly. I would agree with Tom. I don't think this is going to have massive implications in terms of the election. We've already seen a few polls in recent days. They can't fully capture the extent to which this has cut through. But the indications are this hasn't made a big dent in Labour's poll ratings. The thing I would say, though, is it was ever thus. So under first past the post, both political parties are very broad churches. Every Labour leader, I used to work for Ed Miliband uh, back in the day when he was leader of the opposition, every Labour leader has to manage a party. It's actually, I think, much more difficult in opposition to manage that broad church sometimes than when you're in government. And so how do you, how do you, I mean, if you were marking him, how do you think he is managing that broad church? Well, I would say, I would say on Diane Abbott, it's been handled poorly and I don't think that there are many people around Keir Starmer who would privately say try and make the case that it had been handled well. And is it More him or is it the people around him? I mean, I think it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's always going to be a mixture, right? But I think if you look more broadly, in terms of the handling around kind of candidates, there's a lot of complaints from the left of the party about people being parachuted into seats late, about um, certain candidates of the left um, being excluded because of complaints about conduct online. Mm. This always happens, and I would say actually it shows that Keir Starmer is quite effectively thinking about what kind of parliamentary mm. Labour Party he wants. He's thinking, you can see from some of the candidates he's, he's in, that the party mm. have been involved in selecting, they are selecting some very highly able candidates. They're thinking about, if we're a two-term government, mm. who do we but want to on, be, who do we want to be in our cabinet? How all this is happening? Because there are some people who have discovered, well, let's, let's take one case, Lloyd Russell Moyle, uh, uh, Brighton Kempton MP up until dissolution. The day before dissolution, an anonymous complaint about his behaviour was brought against him. He's not allowed to know who's made this complaint. It dates back eight years. And because that process has now kicked in, mm -hmm. he's not allowed to stand for that seat. Me he's not allowed to clear his name. He'll be out of a job as an MP for the next however many years the next parliament runs. I mean, I, I, I mean, that I think is a... That yeah, is a I think, gross extension but, but, of power. But I think you can criticise those sorts of processes, and I don't think that, you know, they're not necessarily the processes that I would defend, but every Labour leader, in fact, every party leader, does use these kinds of processes. So, so for example, every under, party leader under, uses well, if you anonymous look at, if you, well, complaints. If you, if you look at under Jeremy Corbyn, mm. for example, there was a Keir Keir Starmer, a Keir Keir Starmer ally, Sally, Sally Gimson, who was selected by a local party and who was deselected very, very late in the day mm. as a result of complaints. So, uh, unfortunately, politics is quite a dirty business. Um, you know, things things happen like this. But I don't think of, it's unusual. In though. terms of the, the Diane Abbott case, it has overshadowed a number of their announcements this week, has mm -hmm. it not? Whether it's GB Energy, mm. whether it's uh, easing the pressure on NHS waiting yeah. lists. And Keir Starmer today said she's free to go forward isn't as a Labour candidate. Could have done that though, how 24 of, hours ago, 48 hours ago. All of these ago. announcements from Keir Starmer this week, none of them are new. They're things that he's announced before. Yes, there's slightly more detail towards. Of course, he said he's going to get down NHS waiting list. GB Energy was announced, of course, at the uh, uh, conference in September. These are all this just is, repeating. Th and, it, and this, but, this but, is why it matters, but, though, yes. right? Because no but, one's listening to this general but, election campaign. 
He could say anything on policy. But no one is listening. I mean, the country I mean, has made know. up its mind. The polls haven't budged. They haven't budged for months. Mm. Uh, Rishi but Sunak has announced basically one new policy every single day. It hasn't shifted things. People are glazed over. This is not an election about policy. This is, this is an election this, about punishment. But, but, okay. but, but, but this is a, reflect, a reflection of the sort of general election campaign that Labour are very intentionally running. Mm. So they are playing quite a risk of our strategy. That is intentional because they want to convince voters that they can deliver. And therefore, they don't mind if they get tarred with the brush of promising incremental change. They are going for exactly the opposite strategy okay. of Jeremy Corbyn mm. in 2019, where it was a kind of bells and whistles manifesto, lots of expensive pledges. People liked the pledges. They didn't believe Labour could deliver it. Understood. Right. Let's talk about what the Conservatives did announce this week. A compulsory national service, the Triple Lock Plus and a crackdown today. They announced on antisocial behaviour and fly tipping, arguably policies that appeal to a certain demographic, not this demographic though. Do you want to vote? Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to ask, why do you hate young people so much? No. You're making us go into the army, you're making us... No, you'll have a choice. You'll have yeah, a choice. I've volunteered all my life and then I've done so much. Then you will love it. Why do I have to do it again when I'm finally coming out of education? And then oh, because I think the culture of service... I wouldn't do it like that. A cultural service is a good thing for our community. And you'll have a choice. You're welcome. So that happened today. I wonder if that young man was watching Newsnight on Tuesday when we spoke to Conservative Secretary of State for Transport, Mark Harper. Compared to what you've done for pensioners, look at what you've done for young people. You're going to force them to do national service. You've tripled their tuition fees. You've froze the threshold at which they have to start paying back their student loan. You've extended the student loan repayment term from 30 to 40 years, meaning many graduates will be paying off the debt in their 60s. You invested only a third of what was recommended by the catch-up czar. Uh, to help kids catch up after the pandemic. Rents rose nearly 9% in the last year and houses are, are at their most expensive since 1876. That's why I ask, have the Tories got a problem with young people? No, not at all. That's why, for example, we've cut national insurance contributions for working people. That applies to everyone who works for a living. We've increased the national living wage to a record level to make sure those on the lowest incomes have had significant rises. Uh, you are under 30, Tom Harwood. Uh, do you think the Conservatives have given up on young people? Yes. Do you? It's evident. They obviously have. This is a, this is a core vote retention strategy. Mm -hmm. Anyone under the age of 50, dare I say it, anyone under the age of 64 doesn't matter to the government right now. They've looked at the polls, they've looked at all of the new polls that are out, and I think I should mention that there is a new poll out this evening. Um, it was sponsored by GB News and the Daily Mail. It's from Electoral Calculus, and it shows what would be the largest Labour majority in the history of the country. The Tories going down to below 100 seats. This matters because this is a, a quite special form of poll, one of these big 10,000 voter polls using what's known as multi-level post-stratification regression analysis. Now, that's uh, incredibly complicated goop, gobbledygook, but it's all about individual level polling mm. seats. And I mean, that's and and be stretching terrifying. that out across the country. That is terrifying for, Tory for MPs. MPs. And that's why there is not a strategy from the government to win this election. There is a strategy to mitigate losses. I would totally agree with that. And the other thing I would say is actually when you see this kind of poll, you might think that, you know, Labour, people in Labour HQ would see it and be jumping up and down in glee. They certainly won't be. They will find it quite worrying as well, because I think the biggest risk for Labour, coming back to what some of what Tom was saying earlier about a kind of anti-politics mood in the country, the risk is, is that people see these polls with Labour 20 points ahead and they either think... Labour are going to walk this, don't need to bother going out and vote. Or I can go out and vote as I voted in the local election, so I don't need to think about voting that, uh, uh, tactically in a, a Westminster two-horse race. I can vote Green or I can vote Independent. So Labour are very, very worried about complacency setting in amongst voters. Labour are going to walk this, therefore we don't need to get out and vote for them. So the they're, not to be be, they're not going to be that pleased. The luxury <laughs> to be worried with a 25-point poll lead. When Tony Blair won in 1997, he won with a 12 and a half point poll lead. Now, everyone's looking at these polls and projections of seats and going, the Tories couldn't possibly get below 100 seats. Well, then you're going to have to explain why the Labour Party is currently polling twice the lead that Tony Blair managed to get. Mm. Are all of the polls wrong? Or is there something completely broken before, about how we Before we're... this massive poll came out, I know you've got some messages from, from Tory MPs mm. on your phone. I had a conversation with one Conservative MP who called the weak 
thus far an SH1T show. And that's mm. before this poll came out. Yeah, I, I, I've had people messaging me who you would think had their seats guaranteed, some of the safest seats in the country, who want to know the detail of these new polls seat by seat, yeah. just to see if actually if the Tories are below 100 seats, seats that were and held you, in 1997 You can, you can see that level of despair I think in the campaigning activity that's going on, so you know, it very this very much is an election campaign that's being fronted Rishi Sunak by C Rishi Sunak. Other cabinet ministers, you know, some of them aren't, you've got David Cameron who's on holiday, it does really feel like the Conservative okay. Party have given up. Um, so Ed Davey looks like he's on holiday. He <laughs> is living his best life. Um, what is the political strategy behind some of these stunts? I actually think it's quite a smart strategy because if you're the Liberal Democrats and it's a campaign where there's one party way out in front in the polls, there's no prospect of a hung parliament as far as people are looking at it, your number one challenge at the Lib as the Lib Dems is to get people to talk about you mm. as a third party. And to be fair to them, he looks a little bit silly in some of these shots. He actually looks like he's having a good time in some of them, you know, s sliding down a water slide in a rubber ring. But he is getting the Lib Dems yeah. talked about. And some of these shots, you know, there was one of him baking a cake today linked to the Lib Dem policy of free school meals. They are getting the policies talked about more than they would be otherwise. I think mm. any column inches is good news for the Lib Dems and it's working. 100%. He needs to remind people that the Lib Dems exist. I'm just looking forward to him going zip lining or zorbing or surfing or whatever's going to happen next. Uh, it seems to be an endless round of entertainment, which is brilliant for us in our industry. But also, if they were going to announce a new po uh, policy on uh, a, a tax change or, or, or some extra spending here or there, we wouldn't be talking about it. We wouldn't have devoted this much of time well, in the it, show to it. It also says a lot about us then. Media. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good weekend. That's it from us tonight. I'll see you Monday. Have a fantastic couple of days.